confess to you all that I can be a very, very um, impatient person. I'm sure I'm not the only one in this room that struggles with being patient. But I, I find myself in such a uh, interesting hypocrisy with my impatience. I can be so frustrated with the person in front of me, whether it be in, in line or in, when I'm driving, um, whatever it may be, I can be so impatient with the person in front of me um, because whatever they're doing, uh, they're thinking the world revolves around them. Right? They're taking their time in line, counting their, especially if, the, man, have you ever got behind a coupon counter in line? That's why I use the, uh, that, that's why I use the uh, self-checkout, so I don't have to get behind Paula in line. <laughs> um, or whether I'm driving and the person, um, I had a moment of hypocrisy this week when, When two lanes are two lanes are going to merge together, and you're in the line where all the cars are, and someone decides they're going to get in the lane that's ending, and they're going to yeah. go all the way up, up, yeah. up, 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 and then yeah. weave in front of you. They didn't have a tire shot out, Neil. Uh, <laughs> they didn't have a tire shot out, didn't they? I was driving this weekend, and waiting in line as I should, and someone does that and pulls in front of, and gets right in front of me, and I said, uh. -uh. Uh -uh. And Jessica just looks at me, just very, she goes, you do that all the time. <laughs> I couldn't really argue back that I don't. <laughs> My impatience um, has a level of hypocrisy to it because as I'm griping about the person who cut me off and griping about the person who's taking forever in line and saying things, you know, in my mind, like, my goodness, you just think everybody should revolve around you to get you in line. The whole time I'm saying that, um, really what I'm saying is, and don't they know that it should revolve around me instead of them? Exactly. Right? That's the hypocrisy of our impatience so often. Is that we, we want other people to realize the world doesn't revolve around you, so don't cut me off because it revolves around me and not you. That's the hypocrisy that we live in. And it's bizarre what hurry can do to us. The whole pace of the American life insists that we hurry up. Now, I'm, I am 40 years old. And um, much younger than most of y'all in here. Much, much younger. It's funny, every time I say I'm 40 years old, every time I say I'm 40 years old and that my back hurts or I sneeze and hurt my hamstring or something, um, somebody else around me will, you know, they'll say, you know, 40. Oh, 40 is nothing. I'm like, well, it is for me. I've never been 40 before. It is something for me. And, uh, of course, I'm surrounded by kids upstairs. I make any reference to the 90s and they're just going, they're just looking at me. No concept of anything that happened in the 90s, you know. Um, I can remember when everything took a little bit longer. Um, I, I was in high school in the 90s. I remember when the internet became a thing. Um, my kids will never experience anything but a touch screen. Like, they don't understand anything but a touch screen. I remember when you plugged the line into the wall and you had to wait for dial up internet to do the <laughs> ding, 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 and then you've got mail. Like, I remember that yeah. whole thing. And uh, now Wi Fi makes everything, you know, super fast. We have LTE on our phones. I mean, everything is just so ridiculously fast. And it's amazing what hurry can do to us. It's amazing that we live in such a curry that that uh, a society that hurries us up. We are drowning in all the noise and that noise can make us anxious and crazy. But there's one verse in the Bible that cuts through all the clutter for me. One verse um, that cuts through the noise, the, the stress of dutiful uh, obligations, the stress of rushing and the busyness, and it offers an antidote for me. Because you, if you know me at all, you know I am in a hurry and I am busy. That I, I can kind of blame it on my personality some, but uh, it's also, um, I have, we talked about last week, 
I am a product of the society we live in, and um, I have sped up as the society has sped up. And so um, it's really not about my personality. And so this verse is an antidote for me to help me. Luke 5, 16 says this, but Jesus would withdraw to the desolate, it could be translated, the lonely places and pray. This is hard for us because we find it incredibly difficult to be still. And there's really no place we go that helps us with it. You think about that. There's really no place that we go that is designed for us to be still unless you've designed it that way. Right? There's no place that you go into society where you are encouraged to, hey, slow down. Just relax. Take it easy. Our society is not built that way. I go home. Television, tablets, laptops, phones. Even our driving is filled with climate-controlled concerts where we're usually the rock star. <laughs> right? Pastor John Ortberg, he writes this, that we suffer in America from hurry sickness. Hurry sickness. So let me ask you this question as, as a means of introduction. Are you too busy to enjoy abiding in Christ? Are you too busy to enjoy abiding in Christ? The truth is God is calling us to rest and he's calling us to rest in him regularly. Jesus pulling away and departing from people and going by himself to the desolate or the lonely places and pray. Um, that was something he did regularly. Because it is very difficult to hear the still small voice of God if we've got everything cranked up to 11, right? Everything can get drowned out. Hurry sickness means that we are so awash in the noise of busyness that we compensate for it by accepting Silence with God. Here's what we have to do then. Since we live in a society that doesn't provide space for regular contemplation and time with God, we have to create it. We have to intentionally create that space or it will not happen. Society's not going to give you a space to do it. Your home is not going to give you a space to do it. We have three kids now. One is a teenager and one is a tween. And then we have Eden. Um, they, don't, they don't let you, you know, they don't come to you and go, Mom, Dad, we know that things have really been crazy lately. We just want to give you some space to spend time with God. The kids aren't going to do that. Eden's going to be trying to sneak Rice Krispie Treat out of the, the pantry. Uh, they don't provide that space. And so you have to incorporate regular private prayer into your life. Colossians chapter 4, 2. Turn with me, if you will, to Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. You know me at all, you know that I am not saying that technology, that televisions or tablets or phones are in any way a bad thing in and of themselves. They are simply an, an object. They are a neutral object. They can be used for the glory of God or they can be used for the glory of man, depending on how you use them. There is no way that we can live in our society and Make, our, make the entire society slow down. That's not going to happen either. Can't do it. You don't have the power to do that. That ship has sailed. We live in a hurry up society. But what we can do is intentionally do what Jesus did. You think about it. With all the demands that you have in your life, they pale in compar comparison to the demand that Jesus had on his life. Right? As busy and as stressful uh, and 
the weight that you have on your shoulders, imagine the weight and the stress that was on Jesus during his ministry. And so if the perfect, sinless Son of God needs to step away from everything to spend time with the Father, that certainly means we have to do it. Colossians chapter 4, verse 2 says this. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. There's two aspects to this verse that are crucial for having a proper rhythm of prayer. One, continually steadfast in prayer. This speaks to a commitment. This speaks to um, routine practice. This speaks to endurance. You must commit steadfastly to prayer. And then it says being watchful in prayer. This speaks to focus, clarity, and awareness. So you cannot be devoted to prayer nor be in alert in prayer if you do not commit time where you're doing nothing but praying. So if I am going to be steadfast in my commitment to pray and I'm going to be focused and alert and attentive when I pray, then I have to set aside to do nothing else but pray. As busy as we think we are, it's nothing compared to Jesus, and he had to do it, so we have to do it. Jesus actually commands this in Matthew 6.6. 6. This is usually not the context we usually think about it in. Usually we think about this verse, we think about it in the hypocrisy that Jesus is addressing. But think about what Jesus is actually saying we should do. Matthew 6.6. 6. But when you pray, go into your room. Shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. Now, we usually, right, and the context is hypocrisy in praying. But what is he saying we, we should regularly do? Get away from everybody. Go in our house by ourselves in secret. Shut the door and spend time with God alone. And, and, and church, listen to me. We have no excuse we cannot say to God, but God, you just don't understand how busy things are. You don't understand all the responsibilities I have, all the, the stuff going on in my life. <clears throat> we simply have no excuse. We have to do what Jesus did. <laughs> we see a lot of descriptions of prayer in the Bible. In fact, um, when we did our series Crave, where the entire series was on prayer, we actually took, week by week, we took different kinds of prayer. Mm. Thanksgiving, intercession, uh, complaining. We just walked through the different types of, of prayers that are in the Bible. And whatever kind of prayer we are participating in, it is clear that intentional, attentive, and solitary prayer is vital if we're going to be disciples of Jesus Christ. If you say, I want to be a follower of Jesus, then whatever kind of prayer you're participating in on any given day, that, that prayer must be intentional and attentive and solitary. You cannot say you're truly following Christ if you are not spending alone time with God in prayer. Now, I think one of the primary reasons why Christians struggle with this, because if we're just honest, there are two really, really important things that we should do as Christians. One we talked about last week, getting in the rhythm of listening to Scripture. The second is getting out, getting in the rhythm of praying. Are those not the two hardest things for us to do? The two things that we should do the most are the two things that we have the most difficult time doing. And they're the two things that our flesh and the world and the devil want to prevent us from doing. We have an enemy that wants to prevent us from actually doing these two most important things in being a disciple of Jesus Christ. And if we are honest, we do not do this like we should. And I think there are a lot of reasons why. But here's one primary reason why we don't make quality time for prayer. Is that we have been trained, many of us have been trained, to think of prayer in legalistic terms of duty. 
Right? I'm a Christian, so there's two things I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to pray, I'm supposed to read my Bible. So I'm going to, it's a checklist. Here's my Christian checklist to be a disciple of Jesus. And I check it off, and I mark it off, and I do my list, and, and I make myself feel better about the fact that I've done my legalistic duties. But over time, religious legalistic expectations of quiet times do not compel us to keep it going. It doesn't compel us to seek out prayer. Rather, what it does is it tempts us to bristle at the idea of having to do just another thing. So we're tempted to abandon it altogether. But this will not happen if we are seeing discipleship as delight instead of rigorous religious duty. If we view this as delight. So let me share with you something that may help us rethinking our prayers and what our prayers are for. Stop, first of all, stop looking at it like a checklist to accomplish. Um, here's, here's why. If you view it as a checklist to accomplish something, okay, so you create your discipleship checklist. And, then, and, and that's the way you're viewing it, as a checklist. When you compare that checklist with all the other entertaining things in the world, that is going to look really boring. Right? If I compare rigorous, legalistic, checking off the, of the list of my discipleship duties and compare that to watching a Maverick game, that's going to look really boring. So I'm going to go, yeah, don't worry about that. Let's do this instead. You know what, there's this new, there's this show on Netflix we can binge. Let's watch that instead. And again, I, I'm not saying don't binge watch Netflix. I'm not saying don't watch the Mavericks. In fact, I would encourage you all to watch more Maverick games. It is, enjoy Luca and what he brings to me. But my point is, if that's the way I'm viewing my checklist, and then I look at all the stuff that entertains me, and I say, which one is more fun? Which one do I delight in more? Well, I'm going to delight in this. I'm not going to delight in the rigorous legalistic checklist stuff. But what if we begin to view prayer in relational terms instead of duty? We might find it more appealing to view it in a, in a relationship rather than, a, to put it bluntly, if there is a God in the universe, and by the way, there is, and this God of the universe loved you and wanted to be in a relationship with you, which, by the way, he does, wouldn't it be stupid not to talk to him? I mean, let's just, let's just bluntly think about that. The God of the universe wants you to talk to him. The God who holds the entire universe in the palm of his hand, who is upholding all things by the word of his power, longs to have an intimate relationship with us. He longs for us to sit and talk with him. Now, to put it nicely, if the God of the universe is in control of our day and loves us enough to provide comfort and power for those who seek him, wouldn't prayer be the most important day, most important time of our day? You know the verse we often quote, be still and know that I am God? If you look at the context of that entire chapter, in Psalm 46. Really the context is basically saying this. Stop fighting. Stop wrestling. Against me. Be still. From all your. Rebellion. and Activity. Stop all that. And know that I'm God. And we are fighting so much. In our daily struggles. That we forget his greatness. We forget his greatness. In my class this morning, we were talking about something, and, and my brother Caleb, he just admitted, he just said, there are just so many times I just don't see it from that point of view, from, from a God-centered point of view. And I said, yeah, because we're so, we're so busy in our imperfect discipleship struggle. We're so busy with the Romans 7, bouncing to Romans 8 stuff. We're so busy doing that that we don't step back 
and, and see the greatness of God and how big he is and how huge he is. <laughs> but what if we capture a sense of his greatness and wonder? What are if we, as our last series said, what if we are in awe of him daily? Wouldn't it make a difference in the way that we approach him in prayer? Shouldn't it make a difference in the way that we approach him in prayer? If we're seeing God with wonder and awe and greatness. <clears throat> What if it stopped becoming a religious, legalistic act of duty? What if it became worship? Not, not as a means of pushing God's buttons to get Him to want to give you what you want, as if He is a cosmic genie. <clears throat> right? I'm saying my prayer like rubbing a lamp. If I do it enough times, and I rub that lamp enough times, God may give me what I want. What if we don't do that, but what if we do it out of a response to his relationship with us? This is why the rhythm of feeling scripture has to come first, right? We talked about last week's got to come first. Spending time in God's word, letting God's word soak in us and change us and give us a rhythm of the story and what God is doing. And as it becomes so intertwined with our entire life God becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and larger and larger and larger we can't wait to spend time with him we want it because we're in relationship with this great mighty huge God I've heard people say well why pray Neil if God knows everything already I mean, if God's in charge of everything, which, by the way, we affirm as a church that he is, there is nothing that God has not. Whatever happens on the earth, whatever comes to pass, he's ordained it. Everything. He's got a plan and a purpose for everything. He is in charge of everything. And he knows the end from the beginning. And people say, well, Neil, how can you affirm that and then tell people it's really important to pray? He already knows what you're going to pray for. He already knows what you need. That truth should change the way you pray. Here's why. If God already knows everything going on in me, he already knows everything I need and everything I'm thinking, it allows me to be totally honest with him. And sometimes we come to God and we pray and, and it's like we can't be real with him almost. He already knows the real you. You can fake it all day long, but he already knows what's going on. And he already knows. So it allows us to come into his presence and say, God, here I am and here's who I am and, and here's what I need. And, and just to be totally honest, we can spill our guts before God. We can just pour it all out before him because he knows it all anyway. If God didn't know, then I would understand being a little tentative. Right? If God didn't know everything going on in me, and he didn't know everything I needed, he didn't have a plan for everything, I would understand being a little tentative because I'm like, well, I don't want to come and like reveal everything to him. <laughs> but if he already knows it all, then it should free us up completely. There is no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. Amen. None. We can come boldly before the throne of grace so we can come and we can pour our guts out to God. Listen, if you don't think that's the way we should pray, read the Psalms. It is the greatest prayer book in the Bible. If you don't think we should just pour our guts out to God when we pray, read the Psalms. That's exactly what they do. The Psalm after Psalm after Psalm is just the, the psalmist pouring out everything to God, holding nothing back. It doesn't have to be pretty. It doesn't have to be tidy. Just speak to your friend. You know what Jesus said? I no longer call you servants. I now call you friends. I'm not saying there's that, that we ab abandon reverence. But it's, it's honesty that we need. It's, it's truthfulness. It's authenticity that we need. Can you be good friends with someone you don't listen to? No. 
Can you be someone? Can you be friends with someone you don't talk to? No. I mean, you may know them. They may be your acquaintance. But you can't be close to someone unless you're listening and you're talking. Matthew chapter 6. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. You'll be very familiar with this verse. Matthew chapter 6 verse 9. <clears throat> Jesus says, pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. What is the point of this prayer? I don't think the point of this prayer is, um, I don't think it precludes any um, other examples of prayer in the Bible. We've got all kinds of different examples of how to pray in the Bible and, and what kind of, so I don't think Jesus is saying, this is the only formula you use to pray. I don't think that's the case. So what is the point of this prayer? I think mainly it is to demonstrate that we are to pray according to the kingdom of God and not according to our kingdom. I think that's the point of this prayer. I think the point of this prayer is Jesus saying, listen, when you pray, you pray according to the kingdom of God, not according to your own kingdom. Many of our prayers look like this. Myself on earth. Awesome is my name. My success come and my will be done and give me a lot of things. I could continue, but I think you get the point, right? That's how often we pray. We come to God and instead of coming to him with a focus on his kingdom and a, a, a humble heart, we, we come centering everything around ourselves. The Lord's Prayer is to enlarge our vision <clears throat> beyond all the minuscule, noisy idolatry of our world and focus us on His glory. It causes us to accept something about ourselves. You know what it causes us to do? It causes us to accept our helplessness. You're coming to God and you say, God, hallowed be your name, not my name. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And by the way, if I'm going to have daily bread, you're going to have to give it to me. I need forgiveness. I need to be changed. Praying like this causes you to come with a helplessness. A, a total dependence upon God. And the more we pray like this, the more we can abide in his strength. When we come to God and, and we're praying religiously, right? When we come to God and we pray like we think we're supposed to pray with the idea of, you know, I've got I've to make this look tidy and neat and pretty and put a bow on it and, you know, present that prayer to God. When we do that, it doesn't allow us to see ourselves properly. What God would rather us do is come with the ugly mess that we have, throw it all down at his feet and say, God, I can't do anything with this. I'm, I'm broken. The things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, that's what I do all the time. And when you come with that kind of helplessness and that kind of dependence, then what it enables you to do is to abide in his strength. So instead of coming trying to hold on to your own strength, you're coming saying, I don't have any strength. I'm going to pour that out there and throw that out there right now, God, so that I can depend upon your strength, so that my weaknesses 
show how strong you are. In prayer, we're supposed to take our rightful position. We're supposed to come needy and dependent and helpless that the glory of God may fill us up and he may be our strength. And then I want to end you with this encouragement. This, this is just one of the flat out most unbelievable things in all of scripture to me. That I do not pray alone. Now, I'm not, I'm not talking about other brothers and sisters in Christ praying for me. Now, that is a huge blessing. It is a huge blessing this morning to gather at 830 and to hear other people lifting up me for this morning's message. I mean, what an encouragement. That, I'm, I'm talking about something greater than that. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is our mediator, our go-between. And that is certainly true in a theological sense, right? That Jesus came and he shed his blood so that he's the mediator between God and man. And the man, Jesus Christ, became the high priest. Like that, That's true. But that also means Jesus is actively praying for his people. I want you to think about that for a minute. Jesus Christ is praying to the Father for his people. He is lifting up his people in prayer. Constantly. When I personalize that, my mind just gets blown. Yeah. That Jesus Christ prays for Neil Sandlin. What? You mean my benevolent king, brother, ruler, Messiah, Lord of the universe lifts me up in prayer? So I don't, I don't have to worry when I come to him. I, I know that he knows what I am. I know that he knows all my weaknesses and all my flaws and all my, my, my failings. And, and he knows I'm an imperfect disciple. So I come and I, I pour out my heart to Jesus. I don't have to worry. He's going he's gonna to pray for me too. And then the Bible says in Romans 8.26... <laughs> That the Spirit of God prays with inaudible groanings for us. Have you, have you ever gone to the Lord and been so distraught or so broken, you don't even know what to pray? Like you don't even know where to begin. The Bible says in those moments, just like all other moments, the Holy Spirit is praying to God for you. The Spirit of God is praying for you to the Father. So, so think, about, think about this. Let this blow your mind. While you are praying, right? You're coming to God and you're praying and, and you're pouring out your guts and you're laying it all out there and you're asking God, for strength and wisdom and you're you're praising him and you're maybe complaining and, and you're you're interceding for somebody else you're all these different types of prayers right that you're coming and you're bringing them all to jesus why you do that the trinity is praying for you as well i mean are you kidding me right now almighty god prays for us while we're praying so as I'm lifting my voice to Jesus, Jesus is praying to the Father for me. As I'm lifting up my voice for Jesus, the Holy Spirit is coming alongside of me and he's lifting up in groans that I cannot even hear, but they are real. And he's praying and he's lifting me up to Almighty God. So when I'm praying, I know that I have others praying for me. The Trinity is praying for me. The gospel makes it where I don't have to pray to get God's favor. I mean, my goodness, if there is no other demonstration that I have favor with God, that God prays to himself for me, there's nothing else. There's nothing else that needs to be said that the Trinity prays for, to itself, himself, for me. I don't need any other proof that I have the favor of God. So I don't come praying to get his favor I come praying enjoying God's favor that he's already given me 
so I can come and be real with him. The good news makes it that this favor is also, um, it's the ground for why we have the rhythm of listening last week. It's the reason why, it's the ground of why we come to God in prayer. Our prayer lives, our lives of prayer have got to be based on the reality of the work of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. And it needs to be real. It needs to be genuine. It needs to be authentic. We, I think we are so used to putting on a mask and coming to church and being fake with one another that we even do it when we pray to God. It's so, we're, we're so used to, to not being real with one another because we're afraid of what somebody else is going to think of us. That we, we play that game so often it becomes second nature. And we go and we start praying and we do the very same thing. Last night I was praying for my message this morning. And... Uh, I'll just take my mask off for you. Yeah. I was I was praying and and my flesh wanted to preach a really good message so that people thought I preached a really good message. Right? My flesh wanted to do a good job so that people thought that I did a good job. And I was kind of holding that back from just kind of admitting that to God. You know, I'm sitting here praying to the Lord, but I, I'm kind of, kind of saying it, but not really saying it around. And I had already put this lesson together for tonight and stuff. And so some of these words were some echoing back to myself. And I'm like, oh, great. You know, what well, you're preaching backfires on me because it convicts you. And, um, and I just, I just admitted it to the Lord. I just said, Lord, I said, my flesh is so pathetic that it wants to take the inspired words of God and it wants to lift them up and, and present them in such a great way that Neil Samuel looks good. I said, what is wrong with me? And when I admitted that, it's like the floodgates open. It's like all of a sudden, the spilling your gut stuff just started happening. Because then I just, I, I just began to, to voice what I really wanted to happen through the message. What I really desired. The opposite of my flesh. And, what, and, and all of a sudden, I just began to have this moment with God that was so beautiful where I was just like, God, take, the, the, take my brokenness, take my, my imperfections, take everything that that I have, take my gifts, my talents, take everything that I have, and I, it's an imperfect gift. Like the kid who brings five loaves of bread and two fish. That's not going to feed 5,000 people. I can put together a sermon. That's not going to feed anybody. That's an inadequate gift, right? Unless the Lord grabs a hold of it and does something with it. And all of a sudden, it just began that kind of relational things started happening where scriptures began arising in my mind of what God was saying to me and encouraging me with. And it just became this beautiful moment of me sitting down with Jesus and just having a conversation with my friend, my brother, and my king. But if I didn't get real with him, never would have had that moment. We have to get to a point in our prayer lives where we can set we where we say, you know what? I've already got God's favor. I already have it. So I can be as real as I need to be right now. I can be as genuine as I need to be. I can be the mess that I am right now. And I do not have to worry that God is going to shake his finger at me and condemn me. In fact, he wants me coming to him helpless, 
desperate, dependent, and needy so that he can go, okay, you come to me that way, I can make something of you. But if you come to me thinking you got it figured out and you just want a little bit of help at the end, you see a little bit of extra push, well, what can I do with that? Mess it up. You ever, uh, ever read Where the Red Fern Grows? Mm -hmm. uh, great book. Horrible theology. There's this, uh, <laughs> there's this scene in the movie. I'm pretty sure it's in the book, too. I haven't read the book in a long time, but where the young boy chases the raccoons up into the tree. And it just so happened these raccoons ran into the biggest tree this kid's ever seen. It's just this giant tree. So he takes out his axe and he just starts chopping away and chopping away and chopping away and chopping away. And chopping away. And his hands are bleedy and, and he's, he's just done all, he's, all he can. And then he's reminded of what his grandfather told him that, that we do our part and God does his. So that echoes around in his mind and he, he just says, God, I've done all I can do. I've done my part. Now, God, you do your part. And all of a sudden the wind started blowing, right? And the wind came through and you started hearing the, the creaking of the, the tree as the tree falls down. And it's like, you know what? I did my part and look, God came through in the end and, and finished it off for me like he was a closer. You know, it's the ninth inning, and God goes, all right, y'all did a great job. Let me finish this off for you. Horrible theology. That's not how it works at all. You come to God at the very beginning saying, I, I can't do my part in and of myself. Like, I cannot do it. I need you to strengthen me with every swing of the axe. I need you to strengthen me with, with everything that I do. We will not stand before God one day and go, God, I'm so thankful you did your part and I did mine. We're going to stand before God and, said, and say, you did it all. We are helpless and broken and weak without you. And you are the only thing, the reason why we need anything good is because of your strength in us. Um, that should empower us to just be real when we pray. God is for you. He's for you. 